All right, we're uh, running about uh, 10 or 15 minutes late, um, so I will uh, prevent you from eating your lunch for the next 15 minutes. Um, so I'm going to talk about one of uh, NHGRI's newest uh, consortia um, called IGNITE, which this uh, acronym causes a lot of consternation amongst Terry Minolio, who <laughs> fails to remember what it stands for, so I can take the blame or the credit for that. Um, but uh, it has a, it's a really cool logo, and I have to give credit to the University of um, uh, Pennsylvania crack art, artist staff for, for making this uh, acronym for IGNITE. It, uh, the IGNITE uh, consortium really emerged out of uh, the, the need to address issues in the right to domains that you saw from Eric Green's presentation yesterday uh, on NHGRI's strategic plan is how do we really think about taking reasonably well validated genome technologies and putting them into medical practice and do they actually work in a way that uh, produces desirable outcomes amongst uh, <coughs> patients and other stakeholders. Um, so um, coming out of uh, our first and second GM meetings, uh, genomic medicine meetings, of which this is the sixth as you recall, um, one of the things that the group came together um, to, to discuss is whether there could be some pilot demonstration projects. And I think that meeting, if I recall, was in late uh, 2011, and it was, no, uh, late 2010, and RFA came out uh, in early 2011, um, which, uh, of which, which is stated, which, is, which you're seeing here, um, to really propose uh, projects that would uh, develop methodology, feasibility for incorporating uh, uh, genetic and genomic information into the care of a patient and, and see if that um, actually uh, translates into outcomes. So the UNITE um, network was established after, um, as you'll see, three projects were funded. Um, the goals of the network were to um, build on existing activities uh, that were taking place at various organizations um, that we've learned about through this uh, series of meetings and see if we could uh, expand those in, in, in meaningful ways, uh, not just in academic uh, medical centers, which have a s significant amount of expertise and capabilities, but in other environments uh, um, where the challenges may be greater, uh, diverse healthcare environments, underserved populations, rural populations, et cetera, I think is among uh, what this network is trying to address. So it sort of levels the playing field for, um, for genomic medicine. And in doing so, to build an, um, uh, a better evidence base for the clinical utility of, of these technologies. And, and through our, um, the network's um, efforts uh, to articulate some best practices, uh, both in the area of implementation science, uh, but also um, uh, the area of uh, how to design studies that would actually um, uh, be best used to generate uh, the kind of evidence, evidence uh, that we are uh, striving for, for, uh, for things that we've heard about today and, and over the last two days. So um, this is uh, a snapshot of this consortium, and by the way, I have to tell you, I'm not, not going to show you any data because uh, this consortium really uh, funding streams began uh, in uh, July of 2013, uh, so we're, we're, we're just about six months old. Uh, like the other consortia you just heard about, um, we have a co coordinating center. Uh, Steve Kimmel, who's in the back, uh, maybe you want to raise your hand, Steve, uh, is the PI of that uh, coordinating center from the University of Pennsylvania, and one of his uh, colleagues, Reed Pirates, who you just heard ask a question, uh, is also from uh, that coordinating center. And there are three demonstration projects, uh, one led by uh, Julie Johnson, who uh, was here yesterday, maybe some of you had a chance to meet her, um, a superb uh, pharmacologist uh, from the University of Florida who's looking at pharmacogenetics and I'll go into the more detail about these projects in a few moments. Uh, Erwin Bottinger, who is uh, also um, in the room, Erwin, maybe you could just uh, say hello, raise your hand, uh, is the PI of from, from Mount Sinai who is looking um, at um, the use of genetic information, uh, genetic risk information to alter behaviors um, uh, in African Americans. And again, I'll, I'll uh, talk about that in a, in a little bit more detail in myself. Uh, uh, looking at the uh, use of um, electronic family history information delivered to providers to uh, alter um, screening behaviors amongst uh, a variety of uh, patients in diverse settings. So as you just heard from uh, uh, Lucia, the 
there is a coordinating center here. Um, this really serves as an integrative hub for, uh, for the network. Uh, it's meant to really facilitate uh, communication uh, and interactions amongst the, the sites. We have three sites, so it's not particularly challenging right now, I don't think. And we had our uh, one of our steering committee meetings uh, just a couple of days ago, and uh, the, I, can, I can say that uh, both the coordinating center did an excellent job, but also the, the fluidity and communication amongst the sites is, is, is really superb. And we're beginning to try to understand where the, uh, where the potential uh, uh, overlap in the Venn diagram of our projects is, is, is coming so that we can begin to harmonize across the different projects. Importantly, we want to create a centralized repository of data, both for our own purposes, but also to share with uh, <laughs> groups like this, um, and also to begin to think about how do we connect to other implementation um, uh, programs and networks, particularly within NHGRI that you've heard about, such as CSER, such as the newborn screening uh, network, which are all implementation science, implementation programs, as well as eMERGE and, um, and the PGRM. And we will, uh, for the first time, uh, have our program reviewed by an expert scientific panel uh, later this year. So let me just give you a, um, a quick snapshot of the three uh, projects. Uh, this is the one from uh, the University of Florida, um, uh, run by Julie Johnson and colleagues. Uh, she's the uh, uh, dean of the School of Pharmacy there. She's had ongoing interest in working with the Pharmacogenetics Research Network and delivering pharmacogenetic information uh, to, um, uh, to clinicians and studying how uh, they use the tests and, and the outcomes as a result. Uh, so this is really building on a lot of expertise at that particular site by her group, um, taking well-validated tests that have information already in FDA labels and that have also been uh, fully vetted and uh, analyzed by the uh, Clinical Pharmacogenetics Implementation Consortium that has uh, been spearheaded <coughs> by Mary Relling, who's in the room, and also uh, Dan Roden and other colleagues from the Pharmacogenetics Research Network. Uh, so in this case, um, uh, they are implementing uh, um, in a preemptive fashion, similar to what uh, is happening in the eMERGE network, genetic information into electronic medical records and uh, developing uh, the uh, information systems that are required to deliver that information just in time to the clinicians. The goal is to, to look at outcomes such as um, uh, process outcomes, just simply how do we actually get this information into the right place at the right time and how is this information utilized by the patients and the, by the providers um, and what actions are taken and to also develop the uh, uh, understanding of, uh, in this case, uh, with the CYP2C19 program to look at things that are, that are safety and efficacy, efficacy uh, outcomes. Uh, this is just a snapshot of the overall organization of the program, so extending uh, their, their reach into other practices outside of the university setting to uh, community-based health systems and other, other uh, pra cardiology practices throughout uh, the Florida area. Um, they're also going to begin to work on IL-28B for hepatitis C uh, sometime in the near future. Um, uh, Dr. Bottinger's program um, at the uh, at Mount Sinai School of uh, Medicine, uh, Dr. Bottinger is a nephrologist. He's had a longstanding, he and colleagues have a longstanding in interest in understanding uh, progressive renal disease, and there's been a, a lot of literature published on uh, the uh, APOL1 variant and its uh, associated risk in African Americans for progression to end-stage renal disease in uh, those that have hypertension. So the overarching hypothesis of his study is that informing patients about their risk of developing uh, renal disease and educating them about renal disease will incur behaviors that will improve their compliance to medications for hypertension and overall reduce in the future uh, their progression to uh, dialysis-dependent uh, kidney disease. So uh, he's conducting this study in New York City across a diverse set of practices. Uh, there are uh, academic setting practices as well as a, a strong partnership with a community uh, family medicine practice um, uh, also in the New York and uh, New York metropolitan area. Importantly, this is a cluster randomized pro um, prospective study. So there are control practices and there are practices that are going to have the active intervention um, and uh, again, the, uh, the endpoints that are being measured are uh, having to process measures about the way that recommendations are delivered, uh, the understanding of those recommendations, both uh, particularly at the patient level, certainly whether this translates into better control of blood pressure, uh, and also at the provider level, whether the appropriate uh, monitoring tests are being used. Um, 
Uh, and uh, there's this whole series of qualitative assessments that are being done uh, through questionnaires that you see uh, at the bottom of this slide. Uh, the last uh, study, that my own study, is, that, uh, is building on uh, a project that we've been running for several years to develop a patient-facing electronic uh, family history tool, meaning that the patient's entered the information. It's not done necessarily in the physician's office. The information is captured and put through a series of clinical decision support rules that deliver uh, guideline um, specific recommendations about genetic counseling and screening tests to the patient and to the provider. So two reports are generated and putting this into, the, into a number of uh, diverse care settings that I'll show you uh, in a second. So our goal is on, that you see on the left-hand side is to optimize how this process occurs uh, to uh, facilitate the integration of the clinical decision support uh, rules as well as the reports themselves into the electronic medical record and also through a cluster randomized prospective study with a number of control practices and intervention practices show uh, both the, demonstrate both the clinical utility as well as the personal utility of an adequately collected uh, family history. Uh, this gives a sense of the size. We're in 34 clinics across uh, the United States. Uh, you see uh, their geographic locations. They're uh, very diverse, uh, ranging from academic health centers to rural and underserved. Uh, clinics, particularly in the in the northwestern United States, and we have a, a number of process measures that uh, in implementation science methodology measures that we're using across this study. Uh, I think uh, you're not intended to read the, what's in the cells here, but the point is uh, the kinds of outcomes that we're looking at are at the patient, provider, and at the system level. And as you can see, we're we're trying to capture data, and I think this is true for most of the studies in this consortium at the behavioral, biological, clinical, and financial levels. And we're looking for ways to do this as, as part of usual care. So in some cases, we'll, uh, we'll administer questionnaires. But for the most part, the data that we're capturing is in electronic medical records or in administrative databases. Like the other consortia, we have a number of working groups. These are cross-cutting. Um, there's one on implementation science, another one on dissemination, outreach, education, economics, and sustainability and then a third that's on pro uh, process and effectiveness measures. And our goals are not only to begin to standardize um, these aspects of how we do uh, implementation of genomic medicine, but also to be a vehicle to communicate this information across other consortia uh, that, is, uh, that are part of the NIH um, genomic medicine uh, uh, working space. I think this is uh, my last slide, um, which is a uh, just coming out of our last steering committee meeting uh, on Tuesday, we, we know that there's a, another RFA was, another call was made. There are, there are other proposals that have been, uh, that are under a review. Uh, so the network, we hope, will expand to other sites and other initiatives. Um, we also are thinking very uh, carefully about how we share data, how we, uh, how we, how we put data sharing plans into place, uh, communicating best practices, uh, as I mentioned, and also, um, uh, as we discussed a little bit yesterday, uh, and as Anna Colby had, had mentioned, uh, that we really want to also engage uh, payers in, into, our, um, into our community so we begin to understand what they're looking for in terms of clinical utility, because ultimately sustainability is going to be dependent uh, upon reimbursement, as we've acknowledged in uh, several of the uh, discussions we've had over the last two days. So I don't have a final slide, which is the acknowledgement slide, but clearly I want to acknowledge NHGRI. Uh, and Terry Minolio and her team, um, Ebony Madden, Madden, who is our project officer, and Heather Junkins, as well as uh, Irwin, Steve, Julie, and their teams uh, 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 for making this uh, a really exciting series of projects that I hope to report back to you on with data uh, going forward. Thank you. So I have time to ask myself a few questions. <laughs> no. Uh, Okay, I'm gonna, so I'm going to ask you a question. What does IGNITE stand for? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, um, please. Um, so, so this is open for everybody to join? Or, I mean, for, or only for uh, the U.S.? Well, that's a question I think we're going to discuss this afternoon. I mean, the fact, I, I, I think we would um, want to see perhaps um, opportunities to take pilot projects. We've heard about a number of pilot projects, not just these, over the last couple of days. and decide whether they're, they are um, ones that might um, be um, amenable, feasible, and desirable to do on an international 
scale of some type. Um, I would just say that I think, and uh, Terry or Eric, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that these consortia, while they have their, the, the funded groups, I think there is a way to, to participate in them as a, as a visitor or an outsider just so you can learn. Pardon? Okay. Let, I'll let Terry comment on that. So actually, NHGRI, as you've probably heard, and NIH in general, really tries to encourage these kinds of collaborations, recognizing that it does take some time you know, away and, and focus away from the, the parent group. Um, but the ENCODE consortium, uh, which is a functional genomics consortium, did a very nice job in encouraging what they called, I believe, ancillary auxiliary members. Um, there's, it may be a better term than that, but at any rate, uh, they had a whole policy for, for doing that. We then took that and moved it into eMERGE and have that opportunity. So Actually, the, the Air Force has a personalized genomics project that is participating now as, as, as an auxiliary member of, of Emerge, and they sit on our steering committee. Affiliated, thank you. Thank you so much. One of those A words, yeah. Um, but at any rate, uh, we could do the same sort of thing in Ignite, and we would encourage that. Um, it, to some, at, at some point, you know, it becomes a little bit unwieldy and difficult to manage. Um, the, the Policies are not terribly odious. It's, it's mainly that you're willing to share your data and willing to maintain the privacy of the data that are available. I know, Tim, you, you have done these kinds of things uh, in ENCODE, yeah. So do you want to comment on how that's, how that's worked? Um, I think that it's, it's worked really well um, in terms of, it, it, yeah, it's essentially signing up to the common sh data sharing platform within the consortium and adopting those policies and turning up at the, the consortium meeting, but generally people are keen to do that because that's information exchange. I, I see my colleague Jeff Schloss in the, in the audience. Jeff, could, could you comment? Are there other programs in addition to ENCODE that do this sort of affiliate membership? That's the main one I'm aware of. Oh. What about 1,000 Genomes? Oh, 1,000 Genomes? They were all funded by different ways, but they were Yeah, they, I mean, I think that's So that's another, uh, another, yeah. Well, they may have their own. Right, yeah. All right, I think we've arrived, thank you very much for that discussion. Um, uh, we've arrived at lunchtime, which uh, I think is the same drill as it was yesterday. Um, we have an hour. Uh, also, breakout groups, uh, you should have received an email um, from Rita Chambers last night uh, that was with, with the list of breakout sessions, and it's also out on the, uh, on the, on the reception uh, table um, outside the room uh, with the room assignments uh, and, the, uh, and the breakout leaders. So um, enjoy lunch, and we'll see you all back here at uh, 2.45.